Hello friends, I'm no therapist, but I'm your host, Stephanie Goodman. I'm a wife, a mother, a grandmother, and a woman of faith. Often friends ask me how I have a successful marriage while blending families and staying optimistic in life. This podcast features people with real life stories about success in relationships and triumph over trial. What do you think of when you hear the phrase, man up? To continue the series with our friends from love and later years, my husband Kells visits with Jeff Teichert to discuss what it means to man up. Well, hey, uh, this is Kels Goodman, and I am here probably not as nice and as sweet, as good looking as Stephanie, who normally would show up on this podcast, but the ladies asked us to do this. So this is sort of a thing we're doing. If you remember not long ago, uh, Stephanie did an interview with the Tykerts, and I have Jeff Tykert here with us from Love in Later Years. And they have a growing uh, podcast and um, all the other stuff you guys are doing. Yeah, YouTube um, channel, coaching practice. Yeah. Amazon that, best-selling book, too. That's right, which is awesome. And that's the book right that's there. right there. So we've got it displayed. And, uh, and they're good people. And, they're, uh, and so we decided to spend a little bit of time with them uh, today. And so we're doing multiple podcasts. So this is the second one that we're doing, and it's just going to be me and Jeff because we're going to be talking about manning up. And a lot of times people, when they think of manning up, they think of like, um, you know, being tough and being rough. And and I think what we're going to try to do is go into our experiences uh, of being men and... Uh, and I know that sounds kind of weird, but one thing that we found out, which is really interesting, is that me and Jeff are actually the same age. That's right. And so we're both born in 67. So you can do the math, which means we're about 29. <laughs> and uh, so, but we we, fe- we may feel like we're 40 or so, but we're, we're 29. And, uh, but we're excited today. We're going to talk about manning up uh, and do a little something different. Uh, so what I wanted to do is I wanted to go into, uh, I want to just kind of start and, you know, we can talk about, Jeff and I have some similar experiences and, and I'm going to let him kind of talk about his uh, and some stuff we already have talked about. So we won't kind of go into a lot of review. If you see some of my, the previous podcasts of I'm No Therapist uh, I that I appeared in, you know that I've been married twice before. And, uh, and we talk, there's an episode called rebounds where we talk about that second wife and, and in those moments, those are moments, at least for me, you almost get your manhood challenged where it kind of makes you decide, am I making all the right decisions? Am I doing everything? Because a man in a lot of cases takes care of a lot, or at least should take care of a lot. Uh, and in today's society, it's kind of almost, you know, crawling backwards. Uh, you know, we almost, in a world full of, you know, a lot of gender challenges and discussions that we're having, I think the, the role of a man has really gotten confused. And, uh, and so we kind of wanted to go into that a little bit today, some experiences. And so, so I know Jeff and I have both been divorced twice. And one of the other interesting things that we have in common is that one of our exes both live in Texas. That's right. As the song says. So, um, so, but now you had a moment in which, uh, you know, talk a little bit about that background of your previous marriages, just kind of real quick. So that kind of, kind of set the stage for, for where we're going to go in discussion of this. Well, I had two kids with my first wife, and we were together about 15 years, and it took a couple more years to get the divorce finalized. Um, and that that divorce, I, I will say, was the toughest experience of my life, the most difficult thing I've ever gone through. 
And I've lost a brother to cancer. I mean, I've had some other experiences, but that takes the cake. Um, anyway, we were divorced and I was single for about four years before I remarried. And uh, that was in Texas. Now I had come back to Utah for a brief period of time uh, after separating from my second wife, became a partner in a law firm, but that situation didn't really work out. And then I suffered another setback later that year. I had gone to work for a startup and they ran out of money and couldn't pay me anymore. So I was in a in kind of a tough spot. And long story short, I, I went to Texas um, to, to try to get back on my feet. And I was running oil and gas titles. And so I began sort of online dating and online didn't exist when I was... Uh, dating my first wife but oh yeah it was, it was a whole different world back then wasn't it so. right i mean you were kind of limited <laughs> i was a college student at the time but you were kind of limited to the women in your classes or yeah. your student ward at byu in my case yeah that's right and, i remember uh, that so it wasn't like you had a wide selection online it was it was who you saw at the dances and everything so. and you needed to <laughs> to get <laughs> Uh, with somebody within the first couple of weeks of a semester or they were all going to be chosen. Oh, and, uh, I remember that. I totally remember that. So, But I started online dating and that's how I met my second wife. Uh, we had really kind of an amazing courtship. We met at all these beautiful places for weekends together and uh, to had a trip to New Orleans. I mean, there were a, a lot of cool things we we did, but uh, six month marriage. And I realized it wasn't going to work relatively soon. There, there was a big deal breaker issue. And for respect for her, I'm not going to talk about it, but I decided yeah. not to continue that marriage. And, uh, that came right along at the same time as getting laid off from my corporate job in Houston. And, uh, and also realizing that I had failed the Texas bar by one point, which I completely blame her for, but, <laughs> because I didn't get of to course. study all summer. <laughs> um, but so I had that that problem, and then my car was on the verge of dying uh, when I headed back to to Utah from Texas. So that's kind of the very brief overview of my two my two marriages. Yeah. I think it, mine kind of was very similar where, yeah, I was, what's ironic is I met my second wife online and she was in Texas. I was actually in Virginia for a short while and, and we actually went to New Orleans too. In fact, every date of ours was like a vacation, you know, so I didn't really. Oh, we, right. That was so you know, fun, you know. Oh yeah, it was totally. Yeah. Because I was, I was you know, we never, we never really got to see each other just be hanging out. You know, there wasn't a lot of hanging. It was just more every day, every visit, every date was going somewhere nice, you know. Same here. Yeah. So that's, exact where, same. that's where all my money went. So until <laughs> we got married and then, then it really hit the fan after that. But anyway, so yeah, it's a very similar situation and really set the stage, I think, for uh, for the manhood, so to speak, to be challenged. Right. Uh, you know, so that's, that's where you're like, okay, I, what have I gotten myself into? And, uh, so it became a difficult situation. Um, anyway, yeah, I, I, in one of my other episodes or one of Stephanie's other episodes, uh, on her show, um, we talk about how, on one of our trips, and of course by this time, this is just literally a few weeks ago, Stephanie and I are stuck in Houston, and uh, we were on our way to South Padre Island, and uh, our bank cards quit working mm. because our bank took new ownership. And so we're stuck here in Houston, and we have to be there for several days because we had to have our bank cards overnighted to us. So we couldn't go anywhere. We couldn't rent a car. We couldn't do anything. And so it made Stephanie and I have to kind of sit back and actually take a second look at what did I do wrong? And, and, 
And as we sat and talked about it, and we actually did a podcast while we were in the middle of this challenge that we were having. Wow. And uh, and when we did that, it made us kind of sit and go, okay, what happened? Wait, Because we kind of fought a little bit. We actually, we don't fight much. Stephanie and I have a really good relationship. And so this was one of those rare moments where we were like, what stress do we... Stress took over. Yeah, the stress totally took over. And, and we were just... We weren't sure what to do, and, and it kind of made us have to sit in our hotel room, almost like the Lord was saying, okay, you guys, you got some stuff to work out. You're not going anywhere, <laughs> and so we're banning you to your room. And uh, and so when we did that, it allowed us to rethink things, and one of those things that we kind of revealed was that it was my struggle with my manhood. Mm. and And I talked about how 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 when you you compare yourself to other men you worry about this especially with facebook and things like that where you get to see where the other people who who are in your field what they're doing and you're stuck in a hotel or you're not doing anything for a while or work isn't going as well and and the other guys look really good and and you kind of you kind of makes you check your man card and go do I have what it takes, you know, from the stuff that I dreamed about? And so when you're when you're stuck in a hotel room with with no money, it makes you literally sit there and say, I've got to rethink these things. I'm, I'm in my 50s now. I shouldn't be messing with this kind of stuff. You've probably felt like that before. I'm sure you 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 told you told me of a story that that uh, that happened. Why don't you why don't you recall that for us? Yeah, yeah, certainly. I had an experience being stranded also, and this, uh, I've already sort of recounted my first stint in Utah after getting divorced, and I had had two career setbacks. And after that, I was, uh, I had had my kids through the holidays, and so I was taking them back up to Washington where their mother lived, and I got stranded in a little uh, town in the middle of nowhere called Snowville, Utah. Oh man! Got stranded at the Flying J because I went into the to buy a soda or something and came out uh, and couldn't start my car. It wouldn't wouldn't start. And long story short, we we thought it was the timing belt, and that's what it turned out to be. But it was New Year's Eve, so I knew for two days nobody was going to be able to look at my car. Uh, I also knew I probably only had about three hundred bucks in my checking account. So um, it wasn't enough for the timing belt, even if that was the only expense. Um, wasn't enough for the tow, uh, unless you know, unless uh, somehow somebody did me a favor, and and uh, certainly I couldn't afford a tow and a motel. And so I was really stuck. I was in a pickle, and um, me and my sons spent that night on the floor of the trucker's lounge at the Flying J. Oh, wow. And uh, the manager was a nice guy. He uh, he brought a hot pizza in. Uh, and I was appreciative. And at the same time, I felt bad because I couldn't pay him for it. And that was, in many ways, the lowest moment of my life. I, I remember thinking all that night, my kids deserve so much better than this. And then the other recurring thought was, I have a doctorate degree and a postdoc. How did I end up here? How am I in this situation? And it was kind of a little bit like Scarlett O'Hara. You know, I was vowing that never again would I be in a situation like this. With God as my witness, I'll never be hungry again sort of thing. Yeah. But I did feel very deeply ashamed of the situation I had put my kids in. Now, I think most women uh, finding themselves in that situation wouldn't necessarily view it as a challenge to their identity. Um, I mean, how many women do you know who uh, have lost their job and their marriage at the same time for the same reason? Yeah. And how many men have you heard say when they're asked why they got a divorce? Well, she lost her job and refused to get another one, and she just sat on the couch playing video games all day long. Yeah, 
I mean, you never hear that. If a, if a woman loses a job, a single mom or whatever, people have compassion, but nobody's looking at her as a deadbeat or something like that. But I think we men, I don't think it's even just the pressure society puts on us. I think we kind of have this innate desire to protect and provide. And if we put those who are relying on us in a difficult situation, uh, I think we feel that intensely. Um, and in my case, uh, the reason I laid there on the floor of the trucker's lounge all night is I didn't know what to do. I was trying to think of a way out without having to ask anyone for help. You know, that's an interesting uh, thing to bring up is, is uh, I, I agree with you. I never thought of it that way, that when a woman... Uh, loses a job there's a lot of people that come in and rush in and help them out you know a bishopric or or members of a ward or 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 other maybe societal organizations will sweep in and and help a woman out but if it's a man there's there is almost a certain judgment that that automatically happens mostly like you said from ourselves you know because we do have that uh thing and the seed inside of us to say okay i've got to take care of things i got to be able to get in there and and do it and so occasionally we just we beat ourselves up and i think i think that's part of where a lot of the beating up of ourselves comes in because that was that was one of the discussions on the podcast i had with stephanie when we had no credit card when we had no money and cards was was that i just beat myself up and 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 it was just natural for me to to abuse myself to say come on you're you're in your 50s now you should be you should be past all this silliness right but, but we're not you know and so it's so it's pretty natural for for us to have to come in and 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 try to hide whatever it was that we've done you know and get out of it as quick as you can you know so uh, well i know in in the situation that i described um it came on the heels of a period of extended, an extended period of depression resulting from my divorce. Mm -hmm. And as I look at the, the two career setbacks I had, you know, I can explain them and I can show why it could have happened to anybody and, and all of that. But I think we men are not very forgiving of ourselves when we either make a mistake or when we experience a misfortune. We, we think we, need to be Superman and be able to handle anything. And yeah, I'd still like to be Superman and be able to handle <laughs> anything. I mean, I, I, Me too. one of the most distasteful things in my whole world is asking people for help, feeling like a beggar. Yeah. And I don't think women have a problem with that. I mean, it, it, here's a dumb example, but if two people are um, a husband and a wife are going into the Bishop to ask for church welfare, I think the wife is just happy to get it. And the husband feels humiliated. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I, I totally agree. I've seen that. I've rarely had to ask for that kind of help, but I remember when having to get it, it is, it's humiliating. And, you know, so let me ask you, you are a life coach. That's right. And, uh, and, and you probably meet with people that do you meet with men at all in, in your life coaching? I do. I have a male client. Uh, I have more female clients. Uh, yeah. It is hard to get men to come in and do coaching. Now, I want to say this about that, though. We um, we were talking off mic uh, earlier about how TV shows now kind of show men as weak and incompetent and oh, kind yeah. of stupid. Yeah, kind and, of a kind of a married without children, you know, kind of mentality. So, or I'm right. sorry, married with children. That's right. what it was, that TV show. Or The Family Guy. Yeah, you know, The Family the, Guy, the, yeah. <laughs> the husband is just a stupid idiot, you know. Yeah. And and so I think we tend to, as men, we tend to defer to women on relationship issues. Uh, and, and I think the pendulum has actually swung on that. I, th I think it used to be that the father was the head of the house yeah. and that his word was law. And, you know, you go back to the old TV shows, Leave It to Beaver, you know, yeah. even the Brady Bunch, the dad there was pretty, pretty wise. Yeah. And, uh, 
but in in current times it you know I think feminism has probably swung that pendulum the other way a long way that men are sort of abusive narcissistic incompetent clods yeah and uh, and so I I think men are having a hard time figuring out where their place in the world is uh, what is it I'm responsible for and you know do I need to defer to my wife on on every little thing that comes up and I you know I've uh, also mentioned I think that I don't think women are a hundred percent better in relationships than men I think there are ways in which on the average men are better at relationships for yeah. For example, that would include things like, well, you know, women tend to have a, a hormonal cycle. Nothing they can help, but it's yeah. that their moods are much, fluctuate much more, and we tend to be a little bit more steady. So, and I could go on about different ways that men have an advantage in relationships. Yeah, women are the one that that they say, "I don't want, I don't want to solve the problem. I just want to be listened to." Right. You know. Yeah, and that's not that that's every case, but. There are many women that are just like that. They yeah, just want to be. It's not about the nail. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you. And I'm not saying men overall are better at relationships. I'm just saying we have certain strengths. Yeah. They have certain strengths, and then each man and each woman is unique. But the the problem that I have, I I experienced this in the church as a divorcee. That my my experience, at least, was that. In a divorce between two members of the church, um, the woman gets compassion and the man gets suspicion. Oh, he must have been into porn. Yeah. yeah what do you think he did to run, run that nice, sweet lady off? Oh, that's a good point. That's a really good point. Yeah, because, the, I mean, I think on average there is a lot of men who probably do uh, have some challenges. Uh, I mean, I sure. know, in fact, one of the things that I think this, this could maybe curb into is, uh, like in the dating scene, uh, I sometimes feel like men are not necessarily being the men they should be. Uh, hence that's why so many single women are, are not hearing from the men. They're almost afraid to, to ask a girl out anymore these days and I don't know it's hard to say what came first which chicken and the egg you know was it feminism was it uh, um, was it men not being men or men being dishonest that kind of led this into this certain situation to where we're in today where men are not the men they should be uh, because that that does exist that is that is a problem but uh, you don't know if, it, if, that's, if feminism caused that or if that's what caused feminism to, to make the man be more like a mouse. So I don't know. What right. do you think about that? Well, I, I think it's an important question from this standpoint. Whichever is the chicken and whichever is the egg, we, I think we can agree that men are struggling to find their place in society, to find their place in family. Yeah. And I think with this big identity crisis, um, we don't have the very defined role of manhood like we did, say, in the 1950s. Yeah. Um, and I think gradually, more and more, uh, the roles have been muddled a little bit. And, and what does that require of us? Well, I think ultimately the response has to be, I'm not going to define myself according to some role that society imposes on me. How am I going to show up in life with integrity? And yeah. uh, how am I going to do that in a way that brings goodness to the life of the, of the woman I choose? And I think that is a a much more self-directed endeavor than a society-directed endeavor. Um, and I think there have been movements along those lines. Uh, I'm thinking about the Promise Keepers that was started by Bill McCartney, who's the, who was the head football coach at the University of Colorado, hmm. um, took them to a national championship and all that. 
and he he wanted to see men step up and show leadership in their families and set a good example for their kids and all of that kind of stuff. And, you know, they would get together and sign a pact promising to do certain things. Oh, wow. I've, I've never heard of that. That's really fascinating. I know, I know, uh, jokingly, my wife will occasionally, like if I do something, uh, say, if I told somebody, if somebody came to the door and they were a salesman and they wanted to try to sell me something and I'd come straight out and say, sorry, not today. Uh, we, we're, we're not buying your product. Love you. You're a nice guy, but we're not buying your product. Goodbye. My wife will turn around and say, wow, Kells, that was pretty hot. And, uh, and she'll, she'll make it in, in all joking. Like I, like I did something great or something or, or paying bills is ex- or doing the dishes. Wow, Kells, that's that's pretty hot. You know, that's pretty uh, impressive. That's exciting. And she's joking, but it is it is a thing where she's somehow she thinks that it's that because I take on something with some some level of confidence that I think a lot of men have have lost over the years. Uh, she actually likes that as a woman. Um, I don't know if that's a natural thing. I think there is a certain natural level that a man, uh, you know, you can see this in, in other animals and stuff where, you know, man has a certain level and woman serves her roles and those are roles that we've lost. But I think, like you said, through time, we can strive to bring it back by, by doing, you know, what are some things that you think that we should be doing to help bring this natural order sort of back to, to, to a man being a man and a woman be a woman. I'm, I mean, I'm sure every situation is different. You know, not every situation is going to be the same. But but uh, what do you think? What's on your mind on that? Well, I, the, the word that keeps coming to me, and I know I've used this already, but the word that keeps coming to me is shame. Mm-hmm. And uh, Brene Brown has explained that shame for women is... I've got to be super mom and I've got to do a hundred different things on my to-do list. So that, so shame for men is just one thing. It is do not be seen as weak. And Brene actually talks about that in terms of a woman coming up to her at a, or a man, sorry, coming up to her at a book signing and saying, I, I liked everything you said about vulnerability, but I'm curious why you didn't mention men. And she said, well, I don't study men. And he said, well, that's convenient. And she said, <laughs> what do you mean that's convenient? And he said, you see those, those three women over there, my two daughters and my wife? He said, they would rather watch me die on my white horse than see me fall down. Mm. And he said, you know, don't tell me that it's all the dads and the coaches and the other people, the other men that are causing our kids to, uh, to feel shame. He said, the women are tougher on me than anybody else. And, uh, you know, again, what causes all that? I, that might take somebody smarter than me to figure out. Yeah. But I do believe that as men, you take the example of me and my kids at the Flying J on the floor of the trucker's lounge, and I'm trying to think of any possible thing I can do, you know, sell a kidney or whatever, to avoid having to ask somebody for help. And did that serve me and my kids very well? Well, I think when we think we've got to be all armor and nails, um, sometimes we don't ask for help when we need to. And I think we need to adopt the, the mantra, among other things, vulnerability is strength. And that it, it takes courage, particularly for most of us to either ask for help or to be open about our areas where we feel weak. Um, I, I know for me, uh, I, I mentioned that on my first date with my wife, I, I mentioned this in the uh, podcast when we were interviewing with, with your wife, that on that first date, I confessed to Kathy how tough my situation in life was at that time and told her, look, I'd like to pursue this, 
right now I got to get my life together and, uh, but I'd like to get to know you in the meantime. And she believed my life would come together. And part of the reason she believed that is because I told her the facts of life the way they were instead of trying to appear like Superman. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think to some degree, um, being having the courage to be open uh, is a strength and not a weakness, but we feel often like it's a weakness. Yeah. I think, uh, I think I went through the same thing where when I met Stephanie, I was, I was a little stronger individual, but I was very honest with her about things in the past, things I had to, you know, get help on. And luckily they weren't terrible, but they were just, they were there. And, and I wanted to make sure that we were completely honest, but I think I agree with you on a sense that, uh, vulnerability, asking for help, being open and honest, that's actually more manly, I think, than anything. Because, you know, if you, if you're struggling and then you go and you, you get help, you're at least still doing what you can. You're doing right. what you're supposed to do. Yeah, you may not have all the answers, but that's okay. It is okay that you you have a struggling moment. If you don't have a struggling moment, then you're not really growing. You're not really learning. And uh, and as long as you take that situation that you're in and you're saying, okay, I see the situation I'm in. I don't like it. We're going to work on it. And then we're never going to go there again. Because I've, I've been poor too. I've gone from having a lot of money to having no money to back to having a lot of money again. And I remember thinking, I am never going to, I do not want to go in that hole again. I experienced it. It was hard. It was difficult. And I don't, I don't want to, I'm glad I had that experience, but I don't want to be there again. And somehow that seems to be a stronger situation for some reason. And, uh. So I think I think what we can kind of agree with is is that being a man doesn't mean you have all the answers. Right. You know, it means that you know where to go for the answers. You know, in some cases it's going to be God. In some other cases it may be your own father. It may be a bishop, it may be a church leader. It may be, you know, a uh your boss. You know, who knows? But it's okay when you do that because then you take that and you grow and you become better. And I think that's more becoming uh, a man, I guess you could say, or uh, manly, I guess. Right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think so. admitting that you don't have all the answers, but also being willing to, to look for the answers, being honest with yourself and with the woman you love if you're in a relationship uh, is a is a big step toward the kind of manhood we're we're discussing and you know I think most of us do want to be strong for our wives and girlfriends and whatever I you know I can count in the last 30 years the number of times I have broken down sobbing one time was my brother's death, and another time was um, when uh, my son was injured and I felt responsible. Mm. But in the past 30 years, there's been two times. Now, my wife has probably broken down sobbing twice in the last month. Um, <laughs> and I don't think it's because I'm holding my emotions in. Yeah. Um, I mean, I can even, you know, get teary when I see someone in pain, but it's not... You know, it's not breaking down sobbing. Yeah. And I think, but I think a lot of times when we talk about how well, men need to show their emotions, well, I don't need, know that we need to show them like women do. Yeah. I think uh, in many cases, we can talk about how we feel without doing that. And, and quite frankly, I think women are uncomfortable if men are showing that much emotion. Yeah, that's true. I can, I can, I can agree with you on that. Well, I think it's important uh, to walk away with the notion of uh, a man becoming uh, somebody who's changeable, who's workable, 
so that the, you know, and especially now let's talk for a minute to those who are not married, but who are dating. Mm. Let's talk about the dating scene. Cause I know that's something that we, uh, having both of us gone through that dating scene. In fact, we know a couple of the same singles <laughs> from the years of being single. Right. Uh, we share some of the same camaraderie of other people. Um, but, uh, you know, there are a lot of single women that come in and out of our home. Part of why Stephanie does this podcast is because there's a lot of women that come in and out uh, that are struggling because they can't find a man. And so this is sort of a, a conundrum, I think, that, that we're having, in, in at least in our faith. Uh, I bet other faiths might be having the same issues. Uh, but in our faith, where there's a lot of rules and guidelines to dating and getting married, you're seeing a lot of men not being men, I think. That's my take on it. Just because we see so many women that are saying, he won't ask me out. Uh, he wants to just fool around, you know, and or whatever their situation is. And they don't, there's no commitment. So what, from your coaching and stuff, what do, what do you kind of... Uh, take away as far as the dating scene of a man learning to man up, so to speak. Well, let me let me um, back up to divorce for just a second to lead into that. Okay. Um, I, as you know, I've been an attorney for for many years, half my life now, and there was a period of time when I did a did a number of divorces. And then interacting in the mid-singles community as a single and now uh, coaching, um, I've heard two stories from women about that get divorced. Now, these stories are, are they each have their own unique details, but, but basically two stories. One is, my husband is too powerful. Uh, he's going to... Uh, use his old boys network and all of his money and his lawyers to take my kids away and make me destitute out on the street. Oh yeah. I've heard that a lot. So, and then the second story is my husband is too weak. He lays around in his underwear all day playing video games. He lost his job and refuses to look for another one. So, so the two stories I've heard are the too strong of man or too powerful of man and the second one is is the the man that's too weak, mm -hmm. and so if I if I sort of take that that paradigm and look forward into after those marriages end and people people start dating, well I think a couple of different things happen. Um, a a uh, a woman who who had the powerful man, she may either find it comfortable to be with that kind of man and look for another one that she thinks might have a purer heart, hmm. or she might look for a weaker man because she doesn't, that, that the kind that she had before was very threatening. Interesting. And, uh, and then, you know, reverse all that going the other way. So, uh, when I think about men in this situation, uh, not being men and so forth. I, I agree. A lot of men just say women aren't worth it anymore. Um, I, I've heard that from a lot of, of men. But the other thing I've heard a lot is no woman will give me a chance. Now, uh, maybe I'm missing something, but you'll hear no woman will give, give me a chance and it's because I'm too poor, I don't make enough money, um, I don't have six-pack abs. You know, I've heard a lot of stuff from men about those kinds of considerations. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And then, but I dated a lot. As much, I, I could have had a date every night of the week if I had wanted to when I was a mid-single. <laughs> And for most of that time, I was broke yeah. and 40 pounds overweight. And yet I dated beautiful, accomplished women. And one of the reasons I had the option to do that is there's a lot of men that just weren't in the game, that weren't 
I wonder if there's, you know, because I've heard of uh, a lot of men being, like, there's still a lot of men in their 40s that love to just play video games. Yeah. They they either still live at home or they have they have their own place, but they're happy and they're comfortable. They're they're playing video games or they they do whatever it is they do and I hate I sound like the old guy. I sound like I feel like I'm sound like my dad. Oh, you're just playing video games, you kids, you know. That's <laughs> I, I don't mean to sound like that. I'm just saying that I'm using that as the example of at least the examples of that I know of singles who who's who boy boys men will not ask them out or will not get the hint hey i'm calling for you hello because they're happy they're comfortable with what what they're doing and that probably causes this gap that you're saying that that uh, that a lot of men just they don't want to mess with being turned down so they just turn around and and just enjoy their singles life so yeah, I think that's true. When I think about the kind of man that I aspire to be, you know, I think about somebody like President Reagan. Yeah. Um, he was the president when I was a teenager, but um, both strength and good humor and, you know, charisma, the, all of those things, leadership ability. But I heard him give an interview once where he talked about the deep disappointment that he felt um, when he had gone home to Dixon, Illinois after graduating from college. And he tried to get a job as the, the department store, or sorry, the, the sporting goods department manager at Montgomery Ward. Mm. And he didn't get the job. He lost out to somebody who he felt was less qualified. And he was, he was disappointed. And then a couple weeks later, he got a job as a baseball announcer in a, a relatively new industry in a small town. And he sort of got to bigger and bigger markets and eventually to Hollywood as an actor and then into politics. And the rest is history. But Brokaw asked him, so if you had gotten that job at Montgomery Ward's, and President Reagan said, might still be working there. And he said, instead of President of the United States. And he said, right. He wow. talked, he also talked about a woman that he had been engaged to. And long story short, life took them in different directions and she ultimately met somebody else and broke his heart. But he said, well, I would basically have never met the love of my life if that relationship had worked out. I wouldn't have everything I have today. Well, I think one thing people admired about President Reagan was he had this sort of soaring sense of possibilities. And it, 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 he at least exuded this optimistic um, persona. And I think for, for us men, we, we need to get back to that. Even if we're down, yeah. we can at least think there, there is hope, um, you know, I love that verse in this, in Romans, all things work together for good for them that love God. Yeah. And I think that's where our strength ultimately comes from when we can't see any possible way out of this, whatever the situation is. Well, the children of Israel met God in the wilderness and he led them by a pillar of fire and rained down manna from heaven and all of that. Sometimes it's in our wilderness moments when we meet God. And so what are we going to do? Are we going to lay on the couch and play video games? Or are we going to start thinking of business ideas or, you know, applying for a lot of different jobs um, when we're down and out? Yeah. So I guess I guess this comes down to, and we're going to wrap this up. Uh, I think it kind of comes down to, uh, first off, if you've struggled, it's okay. It's totally okay that you've struggled. That's part of it. No matter what your age, no matter what your situation, as long as you go from here to here and you did it, that's what I think that's what the Lord requires. I think that's what uh, a woman requires is some level of confidence that you just go from step A to step B 
and and don't worry about what the competition is doing. I think that would be that's one step, and the other is to not stop dreaming, to not to not stop dreaming of where you can go, what you can do, and that there are a lot of women that are looking for you. So just to just right. to put it in English, they're they're looking for you. So they're there, and they're not looking for Mister Perfect. They're not looking for you know Dwayne the Rock Johnson or whatever. They're they're looking for honesty. They're looking for you know truthfulness and a sense of just being yourself. Seriously, right? So. And somebody who puts them first above all other people. Yeah, and uh, everyone really but God, yeah. and. Yeah, I, I agree with you. There's really, guys, there's really no shame in going through a difficult experience or time. Yeah. That's part of life. I mean, we live in a fallen world. There's chaos. There's messiness. We have career setbacks. We might have health setbacks, whatever. It's not the fact that you go through that and you're not Superman that defines you. What defines you is how you respond to those experiences with inner strength and resolve yeah. and uh, and I think that's what what ultimately is going to define you as a man and and lastly both me and Jeff have both been divorced twice you'd think we would have given up by now but we we had faith in humanity to the point to where we knew if we just picked up ourselves we we'd be able to do it again and find the love of our lives and, oh, and we did. Oh, yeah, we I mean, totally we, did. We both married beautiful, amazing, intelligent women. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was worth the wait for me. Yeah, totally was. So remember to man up. And that's all I got to say. So, uh, Right. So thanks for being here, Jeff. Uh, tell us where, you know, to where you can be contacted. You know, tell us again. Where to go for what you guys are doing? Well, we have a, a group on Facebook uh, called Love in Later Years. We also have a website, loveinlateryears.com. Uh, you can get a copy of Intentional Courtship on Amazon.com. It's an Amazon bestseller. Yeah, it's been selling on Amazon really well. And so Even if you're not ready to start dating yet, maybe you're freshly divorced or whatever, uh, the book talks also about preparing for dating as well as, as what to do when you're dating. So it's really for the whole gamut of divorcees, widow, you know, widowers, and people who, who uh, haven't had the opportunity to marry uh, as yet. Yeah. So, well, thanks, Jeff. It's been awesome hanging out with you. Yeah. If you've enjoyed this episode, remember to subscribe, share, like us on Facebook, and follow us on Instagram. Please comment because I would love to hear about what you think and what you want to see in the future. I'm no therapist, but I am your host, Stephanie Goodman.